Hello, and welcome back to 365 Days with MXM Tune, but with a twist. I'm Maya, a singer, songwriter, video maker, and Oakland native. I'm also a huge fan of history. I love untold stories, gross facts, hidden secrets, anything weird, dark, and funky from the past. This month, we have some very special episodes. Each week, one of my friends is going to be taking over the podcast to share their favorite deep cuts with you. And this week's host is singer, streamer, gamer, Tessa Violet. Take it away, Tessa. It's 365 with Tessa New facts every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff, no, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 365 Tessa Hello! And welcome to the podcast with your guest host, Tessa Violet. On this day in 1987, the first installment of The Simpsons aired on television. At the time, The Simpsons was a series of cartoon shorts on the Tracy Ullman show, a variety program with sketch comedy, music, and dancing. The Simpsons would later get picked up as a half-hour primetime show two years later. Now The Simpsons is the longest-running scripted TV show of all time with 32 seasons. Let's take a look at why The Simpsons has remained such a beloved staple in American television. In the first one-minute Simpsons short, Homer and Marge Simpson put their young children, Bart, Lisa, and Maggie, to bed. Bart's mind is racing. He can't sleep. Homer isn't much of a help. Then Marge tells Lisa... Don't let the bed bugs bite. Oh my God, I've seen this before, y'all. I was a huge Simpsons fan as a kid. Wow, it was a blast from the past. Um, Then Marge sings Maggie to sleep with the lullaby, Rockabye Baby. But have you really stopped to think about what those lyrics mean? Why is the baby on the treetop, allowing the cradle to fall when the wind blows? That sounds terrifying. And even though she's a baby, Maggie knows it. By the end of the short, all three kids jump into the parents' bed, afraid of what will happen to them in the dark. For the record, I did not see this air live. I'm not that old. I was just a big Simpsons fan, so this was like trivia I had looked up myself. (laughs) Um, This kind of humor is what makes The Simpsons so relatable. Even the family name, Simpson, is supposed to sound like simpleton. Whoa. And Springfield, where they live, is one of the most common names for a town in the U.S., second only to Washington. According to the World Atlas, there are 88 places named Washington and 41 places called Springfield in the U.S. Since The Simpsons creator Matt Groening grew up in Portland, Oregon, near Springfield, Oregon, the leading theory is that The Simpsons takes place in the Pacific Northwest, too. Yo, just like me, Oregon, baby! But the show is intentional about not revealing its location. In one episode, you can see a map of Springfield at the police station, but it's actually just a map of medieval Constantinople. Wow, that is a hard word for me to say. They got us there. Before The Simpsons, Groening drew the comic Life in Hell, which appeared in the Los Angeles Reader. The comic was inspired by Groening's experience trying to, quote, make it in L.A., but the main characters are anthropomorphic rabbits. So that takes a bit of the edge off of the existential dread. Hollywood producer James Brooks was a fan of Life in Hell, so he approached Groening to make an animated short for The Tracy Ullman Show. But Groening was worried about giving up the rights to the first comic he ever sold, scribbling a quick sketch of a family of five. Groening's parents are named Homer and Margaret. Oh my gosh! And he has two younger sisters named Maggie and Lisa! (gasps) That's a little too true to life, although now, he says, his father only resembles Homer Simpson in the sense that they both love ice cream. But Groening named the oldest boy Bart, not Matt, because that felt a bit too self-referential. Y'all, imagine being literally the Marge. Wow. (laughs) You gotta draw a line somewhere. Although most critics and fans consider The Simpsons' golden age to have been in the 90s, the show is still producing new episodes today. Comedy writers like Conan O'Brien, Judd Apatow, and Greg Daniels, executive producer of The Office, have written episodes of The Simpsons. Plus, celebrities like Katy Perry, Lady Gaga, Alex Trebek, Anderson Cooper, Charles Barkley, and even Justin Bieber have made guest appearances, voicing the cartoons themselves. Like many cartoons, The Simpsons adheres to a floating timeline. We see the passage of time over almost 700 episodes, yet the characters never age. But one of the strangest things about The Simpsons is the writer's uncanny ability to predict the future. 
As early as 2000, The Simpson joked about Donald Trump becoming president. As we now unfortunately know, this joke is not that funny anymore. During the opening credits, every Simpson episode, we see Bart writing lines on the chalkboard with a silly message from the creators. On the first episode that came out after Trump's election, Bart wrote on the chalkboard, being right sucks. Wow. Even earlier, in 1998, The Simpsons drew a 20th Century Fox logo that read, a division of Walt Disney. In 2017, Disney purchased Fox. Even when it comes to developments in technology, the Simpsons writers were ahead of the game. We see a cell phone wristwatch 20 years before something like the Apple Watch would exist. The Simpsons even predicted that horse meat adulteration scandal that swept Europe in 2013. More on that in the April 6th episode about Ikea's short-lived moose meat lasagna. Maybe there's a crystal ball in the Simpsons writer's room. Or maybe there's just so many episodes of the show over so many decades that certain things are bound to be true to life. But the next time you see The Simpsons joke about the future, remember that their predictions might not be as absurd as they seem. Now, let's talk about music. For today's music fact, we have Lolo Zuai here to talk about an April 19th in their life. On April 19th, 2019, the world shifted. Because I dropped my debut album, Hi Hi's to Low Lows, and it was never the same after that. So today marks the two-year anniversary of my child. Happy birthday. Um, that album changed my life, honestly, because when I wrote it, I was working as a hostess at a restaurant in Brooklyn called Llama Inn. And I was super inspired by that, but more inspired by not doing that, you know, getting out of a day job. And I was also inspired by my past because I grew up in San Francisco, being bicultural, bilingual, but also was inspired by silly shit like dreaming of getting a Chevy Impala and drinking green tea and also, you know, serious stuff like family trauma. But when I met Stelios, my producer, we hit it off. I found my sound working with him. We recorded the whole thing in the Lower East Side. I put it out. I quit my day job and I toured the world. So go stream high highs to low lows. April 19th, 2019, I was opening for Orla Garland in the UK at her London show. I think this is London. I guess I'm not sure, actually sure if this is London, but I'm pretty sure. Let's see. Um, I don't know. Whatever. I'm just going to go with that because that's how I remember it. Um, Yo, okay. So, gosh, I can so perfectly remember watching Orla. After my set, I went to the back of the room to watch Orla play her song. And I so just really remember her song. Um, This song is so good. Ugh. Scene by scene, in the eye, are you not tired? bored, whatever. Um, I can remember standing at the back of that room and watching her play Inevitable on the piano, which uh, this was the end of this tour. So by this time I'd seen it, you know, many times, but it really just hit me in such a powerful way. Gosh, it's such a sad song. Maybe it's inevitable, but this just isn't fun anymore. Uh, 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 dagger to the heart. Y'all, if you don't, if you're not listening to Orla Garland's music yet, you should be. It's so good. Yo, that was April 19th with Tessa Violet. Me, your guest host. Hi. Um, you guys, uh, you can find me everywhere people are found at Tessa Violet. I'm a singer-songwriter. You may know my songs, Crush or Wishful Drinking. Um, and I just released a new single, Games, uh, featuring Lovely the Band. It is... I'm not saying it's the breakup anthem of our generation, but I'm not not saying it. Um, And the music video just came out too. So Twilight Baseball themed, baby. Anyway, that's me. Um, Thanks for going back in time with me. And remember to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts and come back tomorrow for more stories from yesteryear with your guest host, Tessa Violet. It's 365 with Tessa Violet. Every day, so don't leave too soon. I'm gonna teach you stuff. No, it won't be tough. Gonna go a year till you've had enough. It's 360.